Um, I love seeing the the Dharma come to life, you know, even though it's as as we know where they're suffering, there's Dharma, but like how the Dharma expresses in a hospital and how the Dharma expresses in a research study and how it expresses in a design school. And I feel really fortunate to be here tonight in the home of Dharma, you know, where we gather to practice these teachings, these ancient teachings that we've had for thousands and thousands of years um, and and what they mean to us. You know, I think one of the things that I've learned on my journey is that there is the way that the Buddha taught Dharma, and it's important to stay true to the lineages and the practices. And it's also really important to understand what that means for us. Um, you know, the Buddha always said, don't take anything on faith. Don't take anything just because a teacher told you that. Check it out. Do your me search. Like, what does it mean for me? How does that show up? And if there are things in there that don't resonate for you, that's okay. You know, if you're not sure about reincarnation or, uh, code, you know, uh, interdependent, uh, um, dependent origination, that's okay. You know, you can still take parts of the practices, uh, parts of the teachings and see how it ripens in your life. So I'm very uh, pleased to be with you all tonight. Um, this course, this class, has been kind of exploring um, the secular and the spiritual. So kind of um, what the Dharma has to say about a particular concept, and then also looking at it through the lens of a secular approach. Um, and so not really about um, trying to pit them against each other or compare or contrast, but finding the overlap where they kind of handshake and how the best of both worlds can come together to support the ripening of, um, of our karmic imprints to receive these teachings. Um, part of the, the origin of this class was the idea that mindfulness has been pulled away from a complete system. It's been kind of like pulled out of the Dharma and secularized and brought into corporations and schools and uh, research and um, the concern that is it really that effective if it's been pulled away from its complete system? Um, we've been talking on our Wednesday night, uh, Tsanga, a lot about the Four Noble Truths, and we're starting to get into the Eightfold Path. Uh, and these are about the liberation from suffering. You know, how do we free ourselves from this existence of, of so much suffering? Um, and mindfulness is really a foundational key to that entire system. But the question is, what is it without the rest of it? You know, does mindfulness alleviate suffering if it doesn't have compassion, if it doesn't have empathy, if it doesn't have the skillful livelihood, uh, if we don't use it for um, to benefit all beings, you know? Um, I love this. There's this quote. I'm mean, gonna. I got a couple good quotes uh, for y'all tonight. Um, this one's from Francisco Varelia, who is a philosopher and biologist. Um, Practices undertaken simply as self-improvement schemes will only strengthen the very egotism that are intended to dispel. So, if we're just practicing mindfulness for our own good, that might actually, in fact, be reinforcing the very ego that's causing the suffering. So we're going to talk a little bit about that more tonight. So this is the concern of what happens when one element of a full system is pulled away from that system, and we just focus solely on that. Um, the idea is that perhaps mindfulness could be misused to promote destructive forces. So for example, this concept that you may have heard about mic mindfulness, you know, kind of like the commodification of mindfulness to help employees be more productive so that a company could have a better bottom line, you know, or more productivity to fuel the growth of the company. Um, I think, starting to plant some seeds around how mindfulness can be abused by the systems of oppression and capitalism um, because it doesn't have almost like the safety nets or the fail safes around it to make sure that doesn't happen. 
Um, and I do believe that that is unintentional. I don't think that there are people out there saying, oh, I'm going to just cherry pick this one thing so I can make my company more profitable. I think there is a genuine desire to use mindfulness as a way of benefiting people, but we don't really have that full system with it. And there's also, you know, there can be intentional misuses of mindfulness. Matthew Ricard, who's a Tibetan monk, has, is kind of now famous for saying this quote that you can have a mindful sharpshooter, you know, somebody that's practicing concentration and focus to cause harm. You know, that's certainly possible if there isn't safety nets around what we're using the mind for. So I think that it's important to acknowledge that there are some hazards of, of the way that mindfulness is coming to life in the world. And also there is a lot of benefit. Um, and so the, the number one for me is that we're able to kind of expand the reach of these teachings because it is presented in a secular, non-spiritual format. I wouldn't be able to teach in research studies and public institutions and hospitals. Some are very open to bringing Buddhism in and in its over complete way. But part of why mindfulness is spreading so much is because it's universal. It's non-sectarian. It doesn't require a worldview. You don't have to believe in the full system in order to practice it. Um, so I do think that there is a benefit for how we're able to spread these teachings way beyond just Dharma centers. Um, also that the way that it's taught and learned, it's very different now. Our minds are very different than when 6,000 years ago, or sorry, 2,600 years ago. Uh, and our lives are very different. And one of the benefits of secular mindfulness is that it's been modernized. And so we know how the Western mind learns and we know the most effective ways of teaching. Um, and so this kind of modern, relevant, clear way of presenting these teachings for the Western mind are kind of embodied in the secular nature. It's not to say that there aren't, that's not happening in the Dharma, but I lived in a monastery in the Himalayas for a year. And I can tell you that the majority of the people were walking out of there being like, what? <laughs> you know, like super confused. And it's like the, the teachings that work for a certain group might not work for another one. And so one of the other benefits of this secular concept is that it is more universal. The blending of these teachings with stress psychology, positive psychology, with research, we're not really, you know, we're able to really uh, go deeper into that when it is in a secular format. Um, and so that's another benefit. And one of the, the another big one for me is that we can bring in this kind of trauma informed uh, nature to the secular teachings. Um, especially where there might be religious trauma. You know, there's a whole new arm of psychology that's dealing with trauma that came from religion. And so presenting teachings in a secular way um, can, can help kind of sidestep that or help provide a platform for people to discover and learn and explore more about themselves and the experiences that they're having in a non-dogmatic way, in a way that is kind of more open and free, um, rather than kind of um, being dictated to or told, this is how you do it. And so many of us may have aversions to bells and incense and being told what to do and how to practice spirituality. And secular mindfulness presents a, a new way of looking at that that's a bit more sensitive to certain traumas that people might be carrying. So that's just kind of a little overview of the approach of this class. Um, as I said, it's not to pit one against each other. Uh, there are big benefits to each. Um, so here we've really been kind of looking at how they complement and inform each other. So over the past few months, we've been exploring kind of how the Dharma defines mindfulness as kind of this idea of bearing in mind, remembering, not so much as a, a faculty of memory, but of being present, you know, to remember to be here. Um, and um, the secular definition of kind of paying attention to the present moment with intention and without judgment, with a sense of equanimity. So we had a class that kind of looked at both of those and how those inform each other. Uh, 
Um, and then the past couple of months, we've been really looking at the causes of suffering. So our attachments and our aversions and looking at that from the point of view from secular kind of psychology, psychological informed viewpoints, but then also what the Dharma has to say about our attachments and our aversions. Um, and at the root of all of these explorations, for those of you that have been to some of these classes, we've really discovered that they're pretty much the same. Uh, and so that they're, they're not that separate, they're shaking hands and at the root of underneath them, it's the same teaching, it's the same practice. Um, so what I've learned from teaching this course is that it just, at the end of every course, it comes full circle. And we really see how um, it's just two different sides of the same coin which is also very exciting to me because it means that we're able to propagate these teachings in different ways, which is actually how the Buddha wanted it to be. You know, he taught in Pali, which was a universal language at the time, not Sanskrit, which was more of a higher caste language. And so he wanted to make sure that these teachings could be translated. He wanted the Dharma to adapt and change as it met different cultures and different minds. It's part of the reason why we have so many different teachings and practices, because as he traveled across Northern India from his time of uh, attaining enlightenment until he died teaching, and he was omnipotent. He could see the mind of the people that he was teaching and then adapted the teaching for that mind. How beautiful is that? You know, and that's like the anti kind of religious aspect of it needs to be this way. This is what it needs to look like. Um, and I love when we look at all the different cultural expressions of Dharma and how Tibetan looks different than Zen and how it looks different than Southeast Asia. And so bringing this around back to the premise of this class is that mindfulness and the secularization of these practices is how the Dharma is meeting the West. It's how it's adapting and kind of infiltrating, but in a positive way, our current systems and the way that our minds work. So it is really encouraging. It said that it takes 500 years for the Dharma to flourish in a new culture. And we're probably 50 or 60 years in. So we got a long way to go in the West. But this was prophesized. You know, there are there are teachings in ancient Tibet that say that this was going to happen this way. You know, that teachings would come to the West and that they would be kind of compartmentalized in order to meet the needs of, of that culture. So um, and, and final, final reflection on this is that I love the Buddha actually taught in a secular way. You know, he taught in a very universal way. Uh, as I love that he gave that permission for people to try things out and, and see how it feels for them. So um, tonight, we're going to start focusing in on ethics and how mindfulness is an ethic. Um, and as I was kind of, this has been building for a little while for me of kind of exploring this. And as I was preparing my thoughts for tonight, I was like, actually, there is no difference. The secular teachings is exactly the same as the Dharma, is that a system of ethics from a secular point of view and from a Dharmic point of view are for the well-being of all. It's how do we, you know, it's not so much about good and bad, right and wrong. It's about constructive and destructive. And when we look at ethics from that point of view, it takes away the subjectivity of it. You know, that I think if we were to go out and ask people, what do ethics mean? And we'll talk a little bit about it. There's going to be a lot of different definitions. But I think the one thing that we can all agree on is that it's for the benefit of ourselves, not just ourselves, but for others. So kind of um, loosening up on this secular versus Dharma approach in this class tonight and really looking at ethics. So I'm just going to talk for a little bit longer and then we'll get into some practice and then discussion. OK, so just to frame out our time. As I mentioned, mindfulness is really an essential part of this eightfold path. Um, we have a Dharma wheel on top of us here. And so these are the eight paths to enlightenment, to the end of suffering, the liberation of suffering. Um, and so mindfulness is one of those arms of the eightfold path. But I also believe it is the foundation. You know, we need mindful awareness um, to journey on that path to liberation. Awareness is really the key. You know, how does mindfulness inform ethics? We have to be aware. 
if we're pushing our feelings away, if things are feeling uncomfortable, if the suffering of, of another person is too much for us to bear and we turn our head from it, that might not be ethical, right? Then we lose the opportunity to develop empathy and compassion for those beings that are suffering. Awareness of the impact of our thoughts and our actions and our interconnection, you know, that touching into that teaching from Thich Nhat Hanh, which we'll dip our toe into in our practice tonight. We don't, are not, we're not independent, solitary beings. We are living in connection with our world, the world around us, with each other. And we have to keep our awareness broad so we can really feel that and understand it. We have, I, I always talk about this, we have a nervous system that's telling us that we're separate. We have signals coming to the brain that says, you're over there and I'm here. Uh, I can touch you, I can feel you and you're separate from me. But really what we need in order to develop these ethics, this sense of care and well-being for each other is that sense of wholeness, of oneness. So um, awareness as an ethic helps us develop that. And then this definition of secular mindfulness, the, the principles for well-being for the individual and collective that's not based on religious or supernatural beliefs can be kind of the same thing. You know, there's nothing supernatural about compassion, right? That's a felt innate experience that we have. We just have to open to it. It's already there. It's kind of like the Buddha nature. So... We have a wide range of ethics. We have altruism, we have do no harm, we have compassion, um, sustainability, social responsibility, social justice, there's a lot. And so I'm giving myself some freedom tonight to not cover all of that. Mm -hmm. And really starting to feel like this class is gonna start evolving now into an exploration of ethics and meditation and how we use these practices to cultivate a greater sense of living ethically in our world. Um, so with that, we're going to make a transition into some practice, but I would like to just briefly mention tonight, um, that will probably be the extent of the teachings from my point of view for what I'll offer for this class. Um, I will share that uh, my father passed away last week. And so I've been teaching a retreat this weekend. I taught classes all day today. And this is my last class before I kind of pause to grieve. And my dad was a special agent in the FBI and a lawyer. And he dedicated his life to justice and ethics. So I felt like tonight would be a really beautiful way to honor his memory by uh, focusing on these practices and conversations on uh, cultivating an ethical point of view and orientation to life. So thank you for holding that for me. Uh, so we're going to um, settle into some time as practice. And the invitation here, even though this will be very heavily based, <clears throat> excuse me, in mindfulness, I would like you to consider that this is a practice in cultivating our ethics just by becoming aware of what our experience is. So we're going to start with a short reflection to cultivate a sense of intention and motivation for our practice tonight. And then we're going to explore our sensory experience. So with that, let's start to make a transition into our inner world. And whatever that means for you, perhaps closing the eyes or perhaps just softening the gaze. Maybe you're staying seated in a chair or you'd like to transition to a laying down or standing up posture. And knowing that you can always change position or move around in the middle of this practice, really taking care of yourself as you need. And taking a moment just to notice what's most present for you in this moment. It might be a sensory experience like sensation in the body or sound in the room that you're in. It could be noticing how the mind is moving right now, perhaps lingering energy from the day, thoughts, planning. It 
maybe it's an emotion, a mood, a feeling in the heart center. Just taking this time as we enter into practice to notice what's here. And no need to fix or change anything. There's no way that you should or should not be in this moment, just simply noticing what it's like for you and what's most vivid in your experience. And if it feels comfortable, it's bring our awareness to the breath just for a few moments to settle in and anchor ourselves. Noticing where the mind went with that invitation, perhaps into the nostrils or the chest. If being with the breath inside the body is not something that you'd like to practice with right now, perhaps bringing your attention to the upper lip or the area just outside the nostrils and focusing in there. And on the in-breath, inviting a sense of concentration and focus. And on the out-breath, a sense of ease and relaxation as you let go of the air. The next in-breath, perhaps you'd like to imagine that you could direct that breath down the column of the spine, perhaps a sense of lifting as you breathe down into the body. And on the out-breath, releasing and relaxing. Breathing in a sense of vividness to the attention and breathing out, softening the muscles of the face, the jaw, the shoulders. Breathing in a sense of crispness to the way that we're paying attention. And breathing out, letting go of any tension in the abdomen, the pelvic floor. And just for a few more moments, staying with this cycle of concentration on the inhale and relaxation on the exhale. And this is a practice of noticing. So as different experiences arise and abide and disappear through this practice, we can become familiar with how our mind responds to sound, to thought, to the wandering mind. This is insight. No right or wrong, as long as we feel safe. We just notice how the mind moves and Use this practice simply as an anchor to return to whenever it slips away. So from this place of being firmly anchored in the present moment, I'd like to invite you into a short reflection. Calling to mind the last meal that you ate. and starting to focus in on a particular ingredient of that meal. And thinking about the journey that that ingredient took to get to you. Perhaps visualizing or imagining this ingredient growing. 
the nurturing elements of the sunshine, the soil, the water, all contained inside that ingredient. And also considering the energy of those that nurtured and took care of that ingredient, the energy of those that transported that ingredient to a market or a store, the energy of those that prepare the ingredient into its form that you ate as part of your meal. And all those sources of energy are inside that ingredient. If you remove one, the ingredient wouldn't be there anymore. And so an awareness of this interconnection of all things. Remove the sun and that ingredient wouldn't exist. Remove the farmer or the one that prepared the meal and that, wouldn't ing that ingredient wouldn't be there. And now coming into an awareness of the body and that ingredient is inside you right now, being broken down as energy being used to restore and replenish the body. That energy moving through the somatic field to support you in this practice. And so here a question. How do you intend to use this energy tonight? To learn, to practice, to explore. Or simply a stop along the way of this flow of energy from that ingredient into our bodies. And we have the choice of how that chain of energy will continue. So taking a moment to set an intention for this practice, for our time together tonight, of how best we'd like to use our energy. And perhaps considering a motivation that we use this energy to be the benefit for the benefit of all beings. So with the aspiration that this practice is not simply for our own self-improvement, for our own benefit, but for all those around us. Make another transition into the main part of our practice, letting go of any thought forms or visualization, and taking a moment to return to the breath. And whether we're resting our attention just outside the nostril or on the upper lip, perhaps choosing an object of the awareness of breath and the inside the nostrils or the throat, the chest, the abdomen, just letting the mind begin to settle around that experience of breath. perhaps cultivating a sense that the observing mind is simply riding the waves of breath. Receiving this breath. And relaxing into this breath. Noticing as the mind may move away from the sensations of breath, thoughts, sounds, other sensations in different parts of the body. And remembering that in this practice, the wandering mind is perfectly okay. It has no bearing on your skillfulness as a meditator if the mind is moving quickly, 
In fact, it's more opportunity to practice the return. And just by noticing when the mind slips away from the breath, we create the space to choose to return. Continuing to lean back in the mind and observe these waves of breath as they arrive in the inhale. And then let go in the exhale. And at the end of the next exhale, letting go of the attention on the breath and starting to broaden the awareness to the entire somatic field. Noticing the sensations, perhaps in particular areas of the body. Maybe that's points of contact the body's making with a chair or cushion or floor. Perhaps sensations of unpleasantness or pain somewhere in the body. And just as we were riding the waves of breath, we too can ride the waves of sensation. So as these signals come through the nervous system and are processed by the brain, we're simply observing riding the waves of those sensations as they arise, abide, and then disappear. Perhaps you're focusing in on a particular area of the body or doing a gentle body scan, sweeping through the body, noticing the sensations, noticing how the mind may respond to pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral sensations as we discover along the way. feeling the body from the inside as a training and cultivating our ability to feel empathy and compassion just by simply practicing feeling into the body. In this way, we're practicing the foundation of an ethical point of view in the world just by feeling, cultivating a crisp, clear awareness of what's showing up in the body right now.
And in a moment, we'll make another transition, moving from sensations in the body to the sensory experience of sound. So gathering up all the attention and coming to the eardrums, letting the awareness rest in the inner ear and allow the waveforms of sound to come to you. Riding these waveforms of sound Experiencing the present moment through this practice of deep listening. And knowing this too is a training for an ethical point of view in the world by listening. Listening to understand, not to judge. Listening with the heart. Noticing sounds that are pleasant and how the mind responds and sounds that may be unpleasant and the reactivity that arises from that experience. Experiencing the present moment through the sense of sound. Sounds that are consistent and steady. Sounds that arise and disappear more quickly. The space in between sounds. As we continue our practice of listening, taking a moment to notice if the body and mind are still relaxed or perhaps they've tightened up over the course of this practice. Taking a moment to welcome a sense of ease back into body and mind as we lean back and continue listening. In a moment, we're going to shift from sound to another sensory experience. Turning to the domain of the mind and paying attention to our thoughts. So this may be like you're laying down, looking up at a blue sky and thoughts are clouds floating by. 
or perhaps it's like you're in an empty movie theater with a blank screen and your thoughts scrolling across. And just like we've been practicing riding these waveforms in this meditation, riding the waves of each thought, allowing it to arise, abide, and then move along. Cultivating a sense of spaciousness between that which is observing the thought and that which is thinking the thought. And just like with sound, noticing thoughts that are steady and consistent, thoughts that arise and disappear more quickly, and the space in between thoughts. not trying to push away any thoughts or suppress any mental activity, just simply noticing, allowing thoughts to be there, yet not cognitively fusing with them, not thinking the thought, just awake and aware to the mental formations as they arise and abide and then disappear. And seeing this practice of paying attention to the mental activity as a training ground for the thoughts that we explore with the system of ethics. Just simply being aware of our thoughts helps us create the space to choose the thoughts that will be of the greatest benefit to ourself and all those around us. It's okay if there's intrusive thoughts or uncomfortable, unpleasant thoughts. We're training the mind to just be with the thoughts as they arise and then disappear. Now we'll make our final transition of this practice to broadening the awareness, letting go of a specific anchor and just letting the mind move as it notices different experiences, breath, and then perhaps a sound, and then perhaps becoming aware of a sensation somewhere else in the body cultivating a sense of a choiceless awareness, not directing or forcing the breath to a particular object, just relaxing into a way of being that we notice the mind moving from one experience to the next 
and the spaces in between. Perhaps now even letting go of any idea that we're meditating or any concept that requires or implies that we're doing something. Just simply being, riding the waves of the present moment. And as we rest in this spacious awareness, turning the attention to this excerpt from Bob Sharples, do not meditate to fix yourself, to improve yourself, to redeem yourself. Rather, do it as an act of love, a deep, warm friendship. In this way, there's no longer any need for the subtle aggression of self-improvement, for the endless guilt of not doing enough. It offers the possibility of an end to the ceaseless round of trying so hard that wraps so many people's lives up in a knot. Instead, there's now meditation as an act of love. So resting together for a final few moments in this practice of love, just by being aware of the present moment. Let's gather up all the attention and return to the breath. And together as a Sangha, as a community, let's follow the next inhale deeply into the body. And as we exhale, letting go of the air, releasing that practice, inviting any movement into the hands or feet as we return back to open eyes if they were closed making any movement or stretches that would help make that transition back into an awareness of this world around us. So thank you all for that practice. That was lovely. Well, you answered my question. What did you notice? (laughs) Yeah, so let's talk about the practice for a bit before we move on with our discussion. What did you notice? Can you tell us a little bit more about the lovely experience that you were having? Well, um, to put it in context, I had a really um, frantic day. Unusually, I usually have a pretty calm life, but today was pretty crazy. So it was particularly well in that regard, in that context. Uh, It was mainly somatic for me. Uh, Right from the beginning, I was really, really aware of the soles of my feet. Uh, But I followed along with you really easily to also awareness of the breath, the awareness of the thoughts. That was really nice. I hadn't really experienced that practice before. I'm familiar with awareness of sound. I love that. 
I love to. One of the things I've tried to do when I'm in an extended state of presence is pause every time I hear an airplane. Sound mm -hmm. yeah. So the sounds were the heating system, the voices, and your voice, tooting horns. <laughs> yeah, I just stayed with, I just followed along. So just sort of a really beautiful, beautiful flow. Thanks for sharing that. Folks online, were you able to hear that? A little bit. Yeah. Oh, oh great. I forgot. I should have okay. forgot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Anyone else have any observations from that practice? I should have picked up the mic. It's all good. Uh, hi, I'm Karen. It's nice to see you all. Um, thank you for that. It was really lovely. I had a really nice meditation and um, I really like the sound and the sensory experiences. It reminded me of a uh, I went on a Shenzhen retreat of that see, hear, feel. And so it kind of dropped me back into that a little bit. And I hadn't done that for a while. So it was really nice. Um, I really enjoyed the sound, sort of like focusing on like in between your ears. Um, that was, I hadn't really done that. It's usually sort of ambient or I could feel it like in my body somewhere. Um, yeah, and then the somatic stuff too of just really being in the body and I think I was like leaning a little bit like I was kind of cockeyed in my shoulders I noticed how sort of uneven and like the tension in my shoulders were kind of un uneven and hanging differently and um yeah and the thoughts were really nice too it was just uh sort of this uh really easy acceptance you know, I'm not trying to push them away or wish they weren't there. I just, you know, got to sort of let them be there. And that, that was okay that those intrusive, intrusive thoughts were, were there. And I really wanted them to go away earlier. And so it was nice to just kind of be like, well, maybe it's okay that they're there. And now I have permission to do so. And so that was actually really helpful. Um, what was that like in that moment when you just let them be there? um I think it sort of made me smile I guess I think there was like a little bit of a some internal smiling of just like a relaxing ease of like I maybe I don't have to fight this or be mad at it or um uh, think I'm a bad person for this um or like why can't this go away um I should be better um, so it was nice to just let it be there and, uh, you know, or, and to have your guidance, I get, it did help, like you gave me permission or something like it was okay. Um, and yeah, I think they just sort of flowed into another one and then it would like every third one, it would come back and I'd be like, oh, yay, here we go again. And then, it, but then it would go away and then like four thoughts later, it would sort of come back. And uh, so it was just like, I guess, riding that wave of that, of just like, oh, it keeps coming back around. But I guess that's the point, so. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Karen. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, you know, the, the mindful, the, the observing mind is the surfboard, right? And so I love that you just use the analogy in your own way, you know, that we're just riding the waves rather than kind of getting swept up in them. Thanks.
I noticed, kind of paraphrasing, I noticed um, early on a, this refrain uh, around something like for the benefit of all. Mm. And um, that really, I found in general, there were a few things conceptually that really landed for me, which um, surprised me because uh, I, I didn't expect it. And, you know, I, I expected more like, sitting practice and um so it was perhaps a combination of what you shared earlier and then with that line in particular coming back over and over i could see i could make feel this connection with the practice and then with ethics something that i kind of difficult to navigate um for me otherwise um and really imbuing the the gestures and the practice with that sentiment um felt very like really resonated throughout throughout it i felt a lot of um you know whatever i was coming in with from the day whatever was rolling around in my head it was another part where you mentioned like what brings you to meditation like the goal and turning it from i'm trying to fix this thing and of stress in my head to loving was whew, so softening and that was like further in, in into the session and i was like whoa all of a sudden like a lot of things happen then. There's another part where uh, just a simple turn of phrase around the the part that is thinking the thoughts and the part that is aware of them. Um, and that kind of directed my me in a way that was like really like where where is i would think a thought okay where did that well but then i'm now aware of it you know and then really feeling into that mm. thank you mm. thanks for those reflections and there's something similar to what we were hearing with these last two reflections around the, well, really all of them about our relationship to the thoughts. And it's like this sense of creating space between the, what's observing the thought and the thought itself. And I really love this idea of like when, when we're listening, you know, I love the, I love the adjacency of the listening part of that practice with the thinking part. So when we're listening and we hear the car, the horn, or whatever fell upstairs, right? <laughs> uh, we don't identify as that sound, right? Oh, it's a it's a car horn. There it is. It's annoying, but there it is. But for some reason, we receive the waveform of a thought and we identify with it. And it's like I was I was joking with Eve, those of you that know our another teacher here. We were teaching that together this retreat this weekend. And I was like, thoughts are like this. <laughs> They're like this like alien face hugger thing, you know, and it's like it's right up on us. <laughs> and like how intrusive that feels you know like imagine if the car horn was right there but we don't identify with the car horn but for some reason because the thoughts are inside us yeah then we think that they're us they're ours we identify with them yeah. and then we're just swept away with them and i think you know we'll make it a little transition in the conversation to what that has to do with ethics so then it's like you know, I don't, I don't always have like the most virtuous thoughts, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> just because I practice Dharma doesn't mean that I don't have uncomfortable or unpleasant thoughts. In fact, I become more aware of them, that they're there. But a practice like that, where we can actually start creating more space between the um, identity and the rece receiver of the thoughts 
then it actually opens up space to choose the thought, not necessarily to bypass the thought, not to push it away, but to open up space so we can choose. Oh, that, you know, a lot of times when I, when I receive the, the thought that is unpleasant, I'm like, oh, that's kind of funny. Or like, oh, you know, thanks capitalism or colonialism for programming me to think that, you know, to, to have that thought, but I don't need to, that's not me. I, I am I am starting to shift my identification as the one that's aware of the thought rather than the thinker of the thought. It's good that you know not everybody can see the thoughts. That that's very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, kind of working in reverse from that practice, we started you know w- with this conversation around thoughts is that sometimes you know acting ethically in the world means that we don't follow every single thought that comes in our head like i'm gonna kill that person it's not a very ethical thought right (laughs) so if we cultivate this is how mindfulness mindfulness of our mental formations can help give us room for choice not identifying as the thought having that space between us and the um the neurons that are firing in our brain that that come together as a thought means that we can then choose, you know, is this thought benevolent? Is it constructive? Is this thought going to help me? Is this thought going to help other people? And then we choose to follow it. As you, you might have heard in the guidance, I use the term cognitively fuse. So in that practice, we're kind of unlocking from the thought and watching it rather than fusing with it, identifying with it, and then following it until who knows what happens with it. Sometimes it might be constructive, but other times it might not be. And it's really hard to do that in the moment. You know, this isn't really uh, every single thought stop and, and, and consider. That's why the practice is so important. You know, we practice creating the spaciousness in our in our mind so that when you know, we're walking down the street and that kind of intrusive thought comes in, we have pathways, we have a capability to work with it, to do something with it rather than like, oh, you know, in the middle of a conversation with someone and you have like a really like kind of uncomfortable thought about this person it's like oh stop let me meditate on this thought we don't have time for that right so that's why we need to practice ahead of time i like to think about the mindfulness all of the practices almost as like preemptive people ask like when's the best time to meditate i'm like before something happened before stress happens you know like get ahead of it by training the mind on how we respond so that's with thoughts and then sounds you know like deep listening That's compassion. The Dalai Lama, His Holiness the Dalai Lama always talks about like one of the most compassionate ways that we can be with someone is just by listening to them, listening to understand them. That's ethics, right? So when we practice listening to that annoying car sound, we're actually practicing a compassionate way of being in relationship with another person. And so that creates... (laughs) Exactly. Someone said the driver. And so seeing mindfulness of sound as a training ground for ethical way of listening to other people, you know, not projecting our viewpoints onto them before they even had a chance to finish talking, not trying to formulate how we're going to respond and missing what they're even saying. This is a system. This is part of ethics, you know, listening, listening to someone. It's constructive. It makes them feel seen and heard, even if it's in a disagreement. You know, especially if it's in a disagreement. And sensations in the body. This is a big one for me when we talk about ethics, because I think that a big part of our culture is like we're numbing. We're numbing. Um, I think we were talking about this the other day. A big part of the queer course, the research study is um, avoidance driven habit looping. And so this avoidance driven habit loops that we get loops, loops that we get stuck in because we don't want to feel something, right? And so this this practice of interoception, feeling the body from the inside, there are no as there is no empathy or compassion if we can't feel, right? And I say this joke a lot when I'm teaching, and it's like, why do we go to the big toe? when we're practicing, like, how does the big toe help me develop ethics? Because when we feel into the big toe, we're cultivating the pathways in our brain to actually notice how we're feeling in the body. And there's a lot of train of thoughts with, you know, a lot of Dharma teachers and a lot of the teachings themselves that say, um, it, acting unethically or acting in a destructive way does not feel good. You can't come home and have a steady meditation if you've been out doing 
destructive things in the world. It's not going to feel good. And so fine tuning the ability to sense into the body helps us cultivate those qualities of empathy and compassion, which are cornerstones of ethics. Um, so really seeing mindfulness of uh, the sensory experience, developing interoception is not just about a mindfulness practice for the sake of noticing the body. It's actually cultivating the ability to feel into an ethical response or uh, to what's happening in the world. So what do you all think about that? What do you all think about mindfulness as a practice in ethics? I think it's great. <laughs> I never made the connection in the way that you did, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm very somatic oriented, mm -hmm. but I never, and, and I'm, can people hear me? Am I talking loud enough now? Or should I pick up the mic? They can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I just, I never, I'm very aware of ethical behavior and right conduct and right speech and right livelihood and, you know, but I don't know, I just never made, and my practice is ex very primarily focused on mm -hmm. but I never get connection the way that you just did. It's really helpful. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> the big toe. <laughs> the big toe is a practice in ethics. <laughs> I think what I was just going to say, I think what I appreciate as a balance is. When I think about doing good in the world, it's a very sort of uh, productive, almost sort of task-oriented, we're going to help this person, or for me, some of my work can be, feels like it's an important thing, but it's obviously really, uh, it's about productivity and working towards yeah. something else. And I really appreciate the balance of like literal non-doing. And that was most of my practice here was kind of like, intrusive thoughts like what am I doing just sitting here I need to be you know answering an email or getting back to someone or helping someone with something else or something like that and so I appreciate that feels like it's sort of for me that's a critical part of the balance of kind of mm. my life is having time that is kind of the opposite of productive mm. or like literally doing nothing mm. and, uh, so that is I struggle with that, and that's a uh, definitely an important thing. Mm -hmm. My teacher, Chris McKenna, says uh, he just emphasizes non doing. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinarily important practice. Mm -hmm. Go sit in the park for two or three hours. Don't necessarily meditate, you just do nothing. And, and, it, and I've done it, and it, it's a remarkable practice. Mm -hmm. yep. Remarkably beneficial. Yeah, it it nourishes, so you can do more of what you are doing. It's really, really amazing. And could you share your name? Life. Life. So uh, for those on Zoom, Leif was just explaining this kind of balance between the doing and then the non-doing um, and kind of seeing the benefit of both, whereas it might feel for a lot of us that like we have to get out into the world and take action. You know, we were just talking about this the other day that like passion in the Dharma is really an aspiration. There is the aspect of action, which is super important, but we can't take action if we don't actually come into the intention first. It's kind of um, this idea of action comes from its intention first, action section second. Um, yeah, and so, you know, it's curious, this idea of like non-doing as a practice in ethics, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Any thoughts from people online about kind of mindfulness and, and ethics, how that might be showing up for you in this conversation, the practice? Yeah, great. <laughs> Um, kind of related to what we've been talking about, uh, a practice I started doing recently that has been really interesting is when I'm sitting and I notice that I uh, was uh, following some thought and 
instead of watching it, I was actually in it, you know, and I bring myself back to whatever I'm sort of intending to do in my meditation. I add another layer on top, which is noticing how I felt when I was off in Thoughtland, and then noticing how I feel now that I'm back. And that's been really interesting. Mm -hmm. It feels much better. Basically, that's like the abbreviated version of it so far as I've noticed it. And so I think it speaks to what you were talking about, where the, you know, in order to act ethically, we have to be present, like we have to be right there with the body and the body will tell us if we pay attention to it is is what I'm doing ethical or not. Is it good? Is it good for me? Is it good for whoever I'm interacting with? So, yeah. 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 Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Oh, I sort of forgot what I was going to say, but I think uh, for me too, it was when I'm in the body and sort of calm, I think I'm a better listener. And it really helps that deep listening. And, you know, when I'm really present, and I can feel that sense of ease in my body that I'm less nervous, you know, there's less anxiety, the anxiety sort of quiets down and I'm less likely to interrupt and interject. And so I, I feel like that's been really helpful for me to be a better listener and then really show up for people at that time to you know, just be a witness for them and not be giving advice or, you know, I can sort of take on their feelings and feel that and, you know, just be there with them uh, when I'm sort of grounded in the body and not sometimes when I'm not or when I'm anxious and distracted, I, I notice I am more like talk, maybe not let someone finish or, you know, I'm worried about what I'm going to say and I you know step on someone or want to have like some great comment or whatever um, advice for them um, but I think some of the most purest moments are when I'm I am grounded and just listening and like loving a friend and just showing that love and I and that feels really good in the body if you feel up to answering this, why do you think that is that you feel more calm when you bring your awareness into the body? Uh, I mean, I, th I think it's sh I'm just out of my head, like it's moving too fast in there. And so it's like slower if I drop down into the, the stomach or into the breath, like it's a slower I can just take a pause and get out of it because otherwise I'm just like zooming around up there like a bee or something, you know, I don't know. Like, I'm just flitting about. But um, if I can get out of that and drop down out of into the body, it's it, it's just more space or more time or yeah, yeah, Beautiful. something. Yeah, definitely. And um In uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, we teach that there's this kind of vicious cycle of a thought and then a feeling and then thinking about that feeling and then having a feeling about that thought. And so we're getting stuck, right? And so a lot of times what you're describing is like we're thinking about what the friend is saying. Maybe it's irritating us or maybe we want to fix them or something like that. And so then we get, we get stuck in that cycle of thought and feeling. And the idea is if we can just stay with the feeling, it interrupts that thought process, it interrupts that cycle. So kind of like the event and the reaction, the event and the reaction we were talking last week, I think in on the Wednesday night teaching about, um, we just keep re-triggering ourselves, you know, it's like we, we, we teach like the, the, the science of emotions is that they happen in a split second. And so the reason why we have longer emotional episodes is because we keep thinking about it. We keep re-triggering ourselves. the emotions really, the, an entire emotion lasts 30, 30 to 90 seconds. But if we keep thinking about it and we stay in our head, then it's going to last a lot longer. 
And so paradoxically, when we bring our attention to our body, even if it's unpleasant, we're interrupting that cycle. And so we can just stay with the sensation, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, until it starts dissipating, you know, and then the thoughts will also go with it. So really um, insightful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dan, I see your hand is up. I'm not sure. Got it. Sorry. There we go. It Sorry. wouldn't let me. It wouldn't let me unmute myself. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, kind of going along with the lines of what you just said. Um, for me, what was really resonating was thinking the thought. Uh, and being the person, be, you know, being the receiver of the thought versus that being the identity. Um, because for me, you know, when approaching ethics, that's where it really gets muddied, right? Um, you want to act ethically. You want to think about, you know, what's constructive, what's destructive. But then when you're being the receiver of some of these thoughts and it's difficult to separate from the identity. Um, you know, for me, that's always the challenging part when trying to, you know, approach life in an ethical way and make ethical decisions. Um, when you don't always feel, when you don't always receive thoughts that feel ethical. Um, and so really sitting with that and, and recognizing the thought and processing what that means and understanding that that doesn't mean just because I received the thought, that doesn't mean that's how I have to act or who I am or um, how that shapes an identity really starts to clear the way for room to start to, you know, approach my identity and the decisions I want to make and what I act on in a more clear and ethical way. I'm not saying it's like always going to be perfect, but it helps kind of create the space like we were talking about um, kind of in the beginning and really just feel the freedom to move through that without uh, getting like stuck. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Creating space. And it's kind of like, yeah, in that space, you know, as, as when we practice mindfulness, it's kind of, it stops there. That, that can sometimes be why mindfulness is just the foundational element of it. But what are we creating space for? We also have to cultivate this sense of heartfulness. And that's where I think a lot of the four measurables practice, loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, being happy for other people's happiness and equanimity of mind and heart, you know, that, that even steady wish for all beings to be free from suffering and happy. So in that space that we create through our mindfulness practice, we can actually then choose the ethical way. We can see the ethical path forward or said another way, constructive. I really like this idea of kind of replacing the word ethics with constructive. <laughs> Feels a little bit less charged <laughs> and less subjective. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Dan. So um, I want to just quickly ask, what did people, how do people feel about the uh, interconnection practice leading us into that, into that mindfulness practice? You know, the reflection of the ingredient, the energy that was flowing through it, and then choosing how we want to use that. What came up for you? What was that like? You liked it? Yeah. I mean, it didn't have a super as powerful. Uh, mm -hmm in charge or impact for me is some of the other aspects, but yeah, I thought it was really useful. Yeah. And I had cornbread, <laughs> homemade cornbread. So mm. yeah, it was, it was good. <laughs> Arugula. Feeling arugula growing oil. So we, we've really been talking tonight a lot. Of, we've been focusing our conversation more on awareness and how the cultivation of mindfulness can kind of create that spaciousness in our awareness so that we can practice the Eightfold Path, you know. Um, and part of that is then this awareness, not, not just awareness in general, but also the awareness of the flow of energy. You know, as I say in the beginning of our class, we have the sensory experience that we're separate and independent, that we're solid, 
um, and separate from each other and really taking time to reflect on this kind of interdependency um, that that energy, the, you know, you can't take the sun out of the arugula. The, the arugula wouldn't be there without the sun. And then the energy that you had to have all these insights and practice mindfulness tonight and come together as, would not be there if, if uh, you know, we remove one thing and the whole thing is gone. And so it's not just about retrospective, it's also forward looking as well. So then again, creating space for choice. How do we wanna use that energy? And it's really important, I think, from a platform of ethics that we understand that we're simply a stop in a, we're, we're a, a link in the chain of this energy. And what the beautiful thing about this incarnation as a human being is that we have conscious awareness of that energy. That's what makes us different from plants, you know, and that we can actually choose how we're going to use that energy. So again, it's the awareness to choose acting in an ethical way, but also this understanding of the impact of our actions and what comes after that. And so I really like this idea of um, using interconnection and interbeing as a way in for our intention and our motivations and really looking at like, how am I going to choose the energy that I just put into my body? The energy from taking in the news, from social media, from who I'm hanging out with. I have a choice of what I'm gonna do with that, the energy that I take in and then what I do with it. And that also goes hand in hand with the awareness practices. So, um, so I had a little reflection question for us, but we're pretty much at time, which is great. You know, thank you for, for your participation and um, really enjoyed watching and experiencing kind of these ripples moving through the room, which is what Dharma is. It's a ripple, you know, that started thousands of years ago and it's still continuing to ripple. So um, thank you for giving me that experience tonight. Um, but I think maybe we'll end with a reflection. Okay, so um, just transitioning back into a posture that feels comfortable to sit for a few more minutes. And returning to that domain of the mind as we use our cognition to consider a reflection on mindfulness and, and ethics. And this reflection is really considering how mindfulness, how embodied awareness helps us become more aware of the impact that our actions have on ourselves and other people. So an invitation now to reflect on a time when you realize that your actions had unintended consequences for another person and how you responded to that situation. just thinking about this experience, perhaps the actions or the impact of what you said or how you acted had an unintended result on someone. And this isn't about feeling blame or guilt or shame, but actually this reflection is also a practice in awareness. So with this situation in the mind's eye, how is it that we can use mindfulness to become more aware of the impact of our actions? How could we use awareness to act more ethically in our personal and professional lives? And maybe returning to that situation and thinking about how cultivating embodied awareness could support you in the future when a situation like that arises again. So perhaps it's staying with a felt experience in the body. Perhaps it's a practice of deep listening to another.
Maybe it's cultivating the awareness and non-identification with our thoughts as a way of creating space in the mind and the heart to choose a constructive path forward. So letting any visualizations or thought forms go and just taking a moment to consider the energy that we've been cultivating tonight, practicing together, listening to all our different reflections on ethics, planting these seeds of dharma, of a constructive way of being in the world. and dedicating that energy to the liberation of suffering, not just for ourselves, but for all beings. May the seeds of the Dharma that we planted in our hearts and minds tonight flourish, grow to fruition, and bloom into the world as we carry our embodied awareness and open hearts from our time together tonight into the next moments of life. And just as we began by setting an intention, let's end our time together with setting an intention for how we'd like to move out into the world from here. Perhaps to consider our speech, both internal and external, to consider our actions and our behaviors as an opportunity to bring the causes and conditions of happiness and freedom from suffering to all beings around us. Together as a Sangha, let's follow one more breath into the body and then letting go of this practice let me go of our time together tonight. If it feels comfortable bringing hands to heart center and bowing the head, just simply as a gesture of respect to each other, to our own Buddha nature. So thank you all for joining me tonight to explore this beautiful concept of ethics and mindfulness. Hmm. So I'll be teaching, uh, be teaching every first Tuesday of the month um, as we kind of explore this evolution of teachings. Um, I'll also be teaching a mandala meditation workshop. Uh, is it next Saturday? Um, the 18th. Uh, so it's one to four Pacific time. It will be online and uh, in person. And so we'll be exploring using mandalas, uh, which are shown here um, as a practice. Um, so some contemplative art for you. Uh, any other announcements? Just a 